And now we're going to have a closer look at what biblical therapy actually is. What do we do when we talk about biblical therapy? Where does it differ from other models of therapy? How is it different from psychology and psychotherapy and psychoanalysis and mumbo jumbo, all the other models that these oaks do? So, biblical therapy has its roots in belief modification. What you believe, what you believe is what you become. Now, that's projecting it towards the future. But historically, what you are now is the sum total of your beliefs. Looking back, because you have a history. And we need to find out what is it that brought you to the point where your life fell apart? What is it that you actually believed? Now, a lot of people say it's your environment that causes you to become what you are. Other people will say, no, it's your education or your lack of education that brings you to a point of being dysfunctional and falling apart, right? Other people will say, no, it's your ge genetic disposition. It depends on the genes of your mother and father. Then they go and look back at your forefathers and they say, what was your family like? And is there some biological factor that causes you to become what you are? In uh, many models of therapy nowadays, they actually believe that alcoholism is a genetic disease. You follow? But that contradicts what the Bible says. If it is a disease and it is genetically uh, caused, then the only way that we're going to get you off alcoholism is if we're going to manipulate your genes. If by some miraculous medical procedure, we are able to change the chromosome composition in your body. Do you understand what I'm saying? If we say it is a disease, then there must be some kind of a medicine that is going to sort out your problem. Well, the psychiatrists do claim but we know from experience and we know from statistical data that none of the so-called psychiatric drugs has cured anybody's problems. You can take an anti-boost tablet, yes, but does it cure you? No, it merely suppresses and it makes you fraud sick if you do drink on top of that. But it's not a cure. You follow? So we believe that people are what they are and they do what they do because of their belief system. And that is why when you come into the center right there in the beginning, we ask you to write your life story. Because out of your life story, we are going to pick up some of the clues as to what you believe. Now, we all know by now that if you don't come to the point where you start believing in the miraculous power of Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross, and if you hold on to the fact that your drug addiction is a disease and it can only be fixed medically, that this program can do nothing for you. But if you do what I'm going to do now and start believing what we teach you, then there is a hope for you. But you have to change your belief system. All right. When we want an answer to the question, why do I do the things I do not want to do? Now, how many of you come to that point where you've done things and you didn't want to do it and you didn't want to do it and you didn't want to do it, my severe way fear, you've done it. And I say, quiet for yourself. And so quite for all of you, scope your horn and flip your mind, slani cast the second. Spinny villa. And I like it. But you went ahead and did something that you didn't want to do because you believed you knew it was wrong, but you did it in any case. Now that question is, 
answered for us in the scriptures, which is based on the statement made by the Apostle Paul in Romans 7.15. For that which I do, I know not. For what I desire, that I do not do. But what I hate, that I do. We need to turn to the Old Testament where we find the basis of all we do. Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. The Hebrew translation would read something like, As he is all along in his heart, so is he at last in act. In other words, what is going on in your heart is what you're going to live out. <coughs> Should ask the Old Testament and a New Testament for Vaisen. Another very important scripture that broadens our understanding of our behavior is also found in Proverbs 4.23. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Now we know by now that when the scripture refers to the heart, it refers to the inner man. We all know that we have an outer man. We studied that was part of the part of the ten foundations. Man is a trichotomy. Now we know that there's an inner man. And we have conversations with this oak, don't we? We talk to ourselves. Often. Right. And oftentimes we listen to this oak on the inside, then he gets us into trouble. Because there's a whole lot of bunch of rubbish heaped up on the inner man that dictates a lot of our thoughts and our desires. You follow? So, Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now he's talking about once there's a whole lot of stuff on the inside, it's going to flow out. And it's going to flow out how? Through your speech and through your behavior. Right. Is jylle met my so ver? Prachtig man. The Hebrew word leb in this context points to the will and the center of man from which flows the outgoings of his life. That's plain. When we examine the rest of the verses, we also find that God cautions man concerning his conversations and statements. The Lord says, watch what you say. Be careful the statements that you make. We will also see later on how that the heart, mind and speech work together in determining our behavior. So what goes on in the inside, what we think and what we say eventually brings about an action, a behavior. So now we can most now conclude from this that our actions are the result of our heart condition our thoughts and our speech. What we see, think and say determine where we land up in life. That is why we are exhorted to God and protect our hearts against outside destructive forces. Now remember what we said quite a while back. By the time you are six years old, you have seen and heard enough. To cause you problems for the rest of your life. Why? Because at that stage in your life, you knew nothing. You know very little about anything. In fact, you know nothing about anything. But what is happening? You are still receiving impulses and images and emotions through your brain, which has got no frame of reference. And where does it go? Straight into the heart. You follow? Now that's why the Lord places a very, very, and listen to me, you guys that have got kids, and you that are going to have kids, that's why the Lord places a very serious, serious warning on grown-ups who allow little kids to stumble. He says it's better for you to have a thing around your neck and a millstone next to it, and you get chucked into a deep river. Why? Because you are contaminating a young, innocent life. When you lie to a little kid, when you threaten a little kid, when you are abusive to a little kid, when you show a bad example to a little kid, because a little kid has got to grow and has got to know from who? 
grown-ups. Which grown-ups? That he grows up with. You follow? So bad examples. They go right into the heart of little kids. So heed that warning. See how you behave yourself towards little kids. Unfortunately, as we have seen previously, we are exposed to images and sounds and emotions as small children, which can leave a deep-rooted, untrue concept in our hearts. And it's amazing the lies that grown up tell little kids. You know, this is terrible. The boogeyman is going to get you. What the owners is a boogeyman? That's the first very quick door opener into a little child's heart to put fear in their lives. Why? Because a father is too slack to give a child a hiding when it needs a hiding. Or the mother is not really teaching the child through a godly example. So now they manipulate children with all sorts of fear talk. Terrible. Proverbs 4.24 says, Put away from you a wicked mouth and devious lips put far from you. Remember now, this scripture connects up with the previous one. Eh? So he's making a connection between the mouth and the heart and the thoughts. And verse 25, let your eyes look right on and let your eyelids look straight before you. In other words, watch what you expose your senses to. Because the very first thing that starts registering in our brain, really registering in our brain, is images. Have you ever noticed you don't think in words? You think in pictures. Have you noticed? Right, sure. Verse 26. Ponder the path of your feet. Ponder means to meditate upon, think upon. So here comes that connection between the heart and the mind and the mouth and the senses. Ne? And all your ways will be established. So the Lord says, hey, be careful what you allow into your heart. Be careful what you say. Be careful what you look at. Be careful what you think. If you keep those things on the right path, your life will turn out right. So this very clearly, very clearly confirms that we are, we are what we are in our belief system because of what we have seen, what we have heard through our senses, what we have allowed into our heart's belief system. Okay. Belief is powerful. Now, research has shown that the average person has seen and heard enough lies by the age of six to cause enough issues for the rest of their life. We said that just now. There it is again. That is quite scary. So we can understand why God is so concerned that we teach our children His ways and set the right example for them. Believing lies produces problematic thinking which produces darkened emotions, which produce godless behavior. Scriptures that you can go and check out is Mark 7, verses 5 to 23, 1 John, 5, 1 John 1, 5 to 10, and 2 John 2, 4, and 21 and 27. Go and check those scriptures out. A person's spiritual, moral, and emotional health depends upon his belief, that comes from the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 Spiritual health is related to believing and knowing the truth. 1 Timothy 2. 4. 2 Timothy 3.7 Hebrews 10.26 John 8.32 Walking in and appropriating the truth. In other words, living in the truth and taking the truth on for yourself to believe in. 2 John 4. And obeying or living out the truth. 1 Peter 1 22. Psychiat psychiatric and emotional problems are always spiritual problems and sometimes physical ones. Now, if a psychiatric and emotional problem stops,
starts in your belief system. Please explain to me how you, by swallowing a whole bunch of antidepressants, is going to sort out your heart problem. Your belief system. There's no ways. It's no ways. All that it's going to do, it's going to either elevate your central nervous system's condition or it's going to suppress your central nervous system by messing around with the chemical structure in your brain. Now, if your brain and how you think with your brain is so important, how can one even think about replacing one drug with another drug? It's most malachite. Or what? Well, you list them some. Very often they are hybrids, a combination of spiritual and physical. Beliefs drive anger and pain. The biblical therapist's role is to help a hurting and healing person identify the lies he or she believes, process those lies, and replace them with the truth. Unless there is the presence of an organic disorder, a person with a life-controlling or emotional problem may believe his present situation is the cause of his pain. This is seldom the cause. The state that you are in is not the reason why you took drugs. You took drugs because of some hidden issue in the inside of the heart that you've never dealt with or that you didn't even know that was there. that cause your emotions to go haywire. And as a result, you eventually took drugs. And now because you took drugs, you are in a suffering condition. Now, it's not the drugs necessarily. They do cause further problems. Yes. They do exaggerate the problems that are there. Yes. But the root cause is not the chemical itself. The root cause is the condition of your heart, what you believe. That's where your problem originated. And that is what has to be dealt with. You follow? So it's necessary for you guys to realize that when you're sitting there with your counselor and you're working through those little circles, think upon and meditate upon the stuff that you hear in the class. Because the stuff I'm giving you in the class is to stir up what is inside your heart so that the hidden problems can come to the surface so that you can see it. Because when I shine a light into the darkness, I can see what's going on inside that room. And now, here yeah, I am projecting truth so that what? The lies that are on the inside can be illuminated and we can see them. And then you must talk your heart openly and freely with your counselor so that they can learn to deal with your issues and help you with your issues. No use wearing a mask, guys. You are putting a disfavor upon yourself. The sooner your mask comes off and you reveal your heart condition, the sooner we can deal with your issues and sort them out. So stop pretending. You haven't got it together. If you had it together, you wouldn't be here. Okay. The biblical therapist may help the client identify a lie that relates to the present circumstances. Place it into perspective and replace the lie with the truth. Sometimes there is the presence of cognitive dissonance. Now, cognitive means to think. Dissonance means to think out of, out of sync. In other words, your, your thinking is warped. You understand what I'm saying with that? You're catching a speed wobble with your thoughts. You're losing control. Right. That's what's called cognitive dissonance. Da is a bikkie van a raas in die koppie. Misschien verstaan jylle dit beter. Ok. Da is a geraas. Sometimes there is a presence of cognitive dissonance. The anxiety caused by holding opposite beliefs at the same time. For example, the struggle one may have over the Bible position on abortion or homosexuality versus his or her own opinion. Now, there are two striking examples. Some people have been brainwashed by the system out there, the woman, 
through this whole women's liberation theology that goes around, that they have the right to decide whether or not they can terminate a pregnancy. And they have a whole lot of good reasons for it. At the moment, you will not be able to take care of a child. You just come off drugs. Now you got yourself pregnant. You haven't even got a husband. The guy that put you in the other time is a useless layabout. I lay on his straat rond. And I hang now up his straat to grond me in Nigeria. You can for you and your consort. They got a whole lot of good reasons why this chick has the right to terminate the pregnancy. But the Bible says, God is the author of life. If God didn't want a little baby to come out of that sleeping around story, he wouldn't have given the life to the sperm and the egg cell. He would have withheld it. You follow? But it is there. And now that it is there, there's only one who can determine whether or not that life can end or it must grow into a full-blown adult. And that's God. Now this chick can have a big anxiety freak out between what the Bible says and what she's led to believe by people and their opinions. The same with the guys that are suffering with gender identity problems. Man, I, I love the fancy little words. You know, gay. How can a homosexual be a gay person? They're the most miserable sods that walk the earth. Because they have a problem with identifying whether they are a male or whether they are a female or whether they are a it. They don't even know what they are. How can you be happy when you don't know what you are? How can you be called gay? You see, it's those euphemistic little terms that they stick onto sin. That they try and make sin acceptable. But in God's eyes, from the Old Testament right through to the New Testament, it's an abomination before the Lord. He hates it because you're messing around with your belief system as to what God made you. If you've got any doubts as to what you are, take your clothes off, go stand in front of a mirror and check the toolbox. And then you'll know whether you're a chick or whether you're an O. And when you're an O, behave like an O, think like an O. But don't come and tune me, the Lord made you this and the Lord made you that. You follow? It's simple. But now the people struggle with this problem. They have gay churches with a gay domini up there. Man, the Bible tells me that all sex outside of the marriage that God has ordained is sin. Now, how can that guy up there stand there and preach the word of God and after the service, he's going to go and lie down with some other dude? You're not even allowed to do that if you're heterosexual. You understand what I'm saying? Sex is out for the believer until the Lord ordains a marriage. Then you can have it. But if you're going to try and twist the scriptures to suit your mind, all that's going to happen is going to be a whole lot of tension on the inside. Because you can't mix truth and a lie and think you're going to come out with a magic formula. All that you're going to sit with is a lot of tension that is going to lead to depression, that's going to lead to anxiety in yourself. Because you're trying to convince yourself of a lie being the truth. It's impossible. God does not lie. So... Having dealt with those uh, emotional and psychological issues when we are out of line with the Word of God, let's go on. There can also be the case of seeking a misplaced identity. Many Christians struggle today to become somebody they already are in Christ through self-effort. Now we're talking about religion. We're talking about religion. Now... At this particular point in time, you might find this difficult to believe. Because your brain and your neuropods has not yet been wired to understand this properly. But spiritually speaking, truthfully speaking, according to the word of God, 
the statement that God makes, that the moment that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you already have received it all. It's all there. It's already inside you. Because Christ is in you. And Christ brings with him to you everything that you need for godly behavior, for healthy living, for prosperity, for a bright future. But because the wiring up here is the Makar, we first have to put this stuff together so that it can agree with what is going on in the heart now. You follow? That's why we need to have our minds renewed. We cannot renew our minds by ourselves. There is no self-help story. I mean, I can say to you, listen, here's your Bible. It's a self-help manual, manual about everything in life. Very, very, very few people have taken their Bibles and have, in their own effort, manage to take the things that are in the scriptures and make them applicable to their own lives without the work of the Holy Spirit. They've become religious, yes, but the issues are not dealt with. They've got a religious facade behind which they hide, but inside there's still a whole lot of rotten bones. You follow? There's a supernatural thing that has to take place. Right. Many Christians struggle today to become a somebody they already are in Christ through self-effort. They interpret New Testament teaching as another set of rules to be obeyed instead of relying on the Holy Spirit to make them holy. Why do you think His name is called Holy Spirit? We receive Jesus Christ and the blood sacrifice that he made upon the cross to sever that human nature that is prone to sinning. But now there's a new creature that has to be taught a new lifestyle. And the Holy Spirit comes and together with the word that he has written, he rewires the brain. So that we are made holy. It's a process. But already, in God's eyes, you are holy. Do you understand that concept? That's why it's so necessary for you to finish the course. Because our course and our program has been logically put together to take you through the process. And it is only the initial process of being made holy. It will bring you up to a point where if you apply what we teach you, you should have enough tools now to see yourself through, not see yourself, but to see your way through with the Holy Spirit for the rest of your lives to continue growing into holiness. We're giving you a kickstart, a jump start. You follow but as you know, I mean, if you take a full battery and you take a flat battery and you only connect the red and the red and the black and you leave the other black off, you must complete the circuit. You follow? So our program has been designed to complete the circuit, to take you from the beginning right through until the end. So that at the end, when you learn about new beginnings, you can be prepared mentally for what you ex can expect out there. And what to do when you catch a speed wobble. You'll have a whole file of reference material. You'll have scriptures relating to certain subjects. You will have certain lies in your life being dealt with specifically from the word of God. That you can refer back to just to straighten out this thing again. Just like a car goes in for a tune-up. Modern day cars now, they plug it in a computer and the computer tunes them what, 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 what. Well, yeah, you got the word of God. You've been on a program. You just plug it back in and now you can figure out. Okay. So 
The Holy Spirit makes us holy through grace and trust in the presence of Christ in them. That is your key to holiness. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And He promised He will never leave you nor forsake you. You'll always be there. Then we have those described in Acts 7.51 who are stiff-necked. We are look, we're talking at certain people. We're looking at those people that are suffering with a complete mind wobble. Then we're talking about the people who are, don't quite understand and know who they are in Christ Jesus. Ne? They are there, but they're not there. Now we're talking about those who are stiff-necked and in denial of their issues. It's okay. Lost mate. This is a major mental stronghold that resists godly change. Now, he's a paar van jylle, but nou die story baie goed ken. Jylle moes a jylle paar rondekies daar by solitary confinement gaan maak het, om die stronghold een bykie af te breek. Nee. Biblical therapists help people to recognize and overcome their denial, so they can accept the healing and godly change, which is freely offered through trusting in Christ. So even for the stiff neck out, there is a sag mark methode. I put it in my program, a lot of people say, hey, can you be so afraid to come to us to sleep there alone? I say, no, let him a bit alone there with the Lord speak. Let the Lord speak alone with him speak. He will go on the other side. The power of biblical therapy. Why is it a powerful program? Biblical therapy does not rely on therapeutic skills or abilities that is of the therapist, but depends on belief and faith in the power of God's word. It's not about me. It's not about Tani Aniki. It's not about your counselor. It's about the power of God's word. That's what's going to change you. It's not my skills. If a hurting and or healing person does not allow God to speak into his darkness, nothing will change. Nothing will change. If a Muslim rocks up here and he refuses to say bye-bye to Allah and hello to Jesus, he's going to stay the same. Because Allah is only going to get him into deeper trouble. Allah, where are you? Let's be starlig van woorden. However, he, when he chooses to believe and act on the wisdom of God, God receives the credit and the glory for the miracle of healing. One reason this counseling model is called biblical therapy is so man would have no room to take credit for the results. This is not the geheime keys of Ado Krieger's therapy. I don't have any geheime sleutels. Uh -uh. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. En die toepassing van sy woord, wat jy gaan verander. Another reason is that the process focuses on problematic thinking errors that are rooted in a false belief system. So, it's about the power of God's word, and then it's about the fact that we focus on your issues, and we compare your issues your belief issues to what the Word of God says. Now, in between the two, you have a responsibility, and that is to what? Change your mind. If you don't change your mind, nothing will change. That's why the Lord says in Deuteronomy, choose this day between life and death. Then he goes on to explain exactly what he says. So God in his in his incredible sovereignty and power that is able to control every single planet in the universe and able to control every single molecule and atom inside material stuff says to you, I'm giving you the right to choose. If he didn't do that, we would not have been created in his image. We would have been like animals, living by our instincts and not by our choices. 
Believing in the word of God is the most powerful life-changing therapy model available to mankind. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus said in Mark 11, 23, Truly I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. Now when he speaks about mountains there, he's talking about spiritual strongholds. He's talking about obstacles in your belief system. He's talking about things that are standing in the way of you becoming godly and righteous and holy and victorious in your life. I mean, he's not telling us, hey, gaan staan nie voor die kopie en sê vir die kopie, hey, gaan val in die see nie. We can do that with dynamite and earth moving equipment, yes. But he's actually referring to far greater obstacles. And those are the things that are in the spirit world. In your belief system. The most potent healing force available to man is the power to believe. Life controlling problems are like mountains. Belief that comes from the truth can remove the mountains. All non-organic problems confronted in the counseling experience are appropriately resolved when the believer practices biblical therapy. When you start believing in what the word of God says, nothing becomes impossible. All things become possible. Since all of the word of God will not be accepted by the counselor, with a traditional mental paradigm, perhaps a quantitative measurement would be more appropriate. Therefore, 100% of all non-organic counseling problems are appropriately resolved. Please note the adverb, appropriately resolved. In other words, what am I busy telling you? I'm telling you that if you start believing in what the Word of God says, there will be no problems that you cannot solve. There is this word that they use very much in therapy. Prognosis. What is your prognosis? You do a diagnosis and then out of the diagnosis you determine a prognosis. A prognosis tells you to what degree you think this person can come right. Now, if you are not willing to submit to God, your prognosis is zero. There's going to be no change in your life. In fact, your life is progressively going to get worse. But if you are willing to put your faith in God and submit to His authority, your prognosis to recover and to do more than recover is 100%. Now with us, it's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. You either become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ or you don't. You either get saved, born again, get filled with the Holy Spirit, your mind renewed, or nothing happens. That's it. That's it. Now you can cruise through the program wearing a little mask on the front. You know what's going to happen when you get out there? The mask is going to come off, you're going to fall flat in your face. And you're going to come back for a second round. And this time around, let's hope that you drop the mask. And make a real decision to really follow the Lord and obey Him. Because it's a heart issue. It's yeah, in your heart. That's where the change must come. Not just outwardly by obeying the rules. The rules here are not all that hard. They're easy. Any person can obey the rules in this place. If they just put a little bit of effort into it. But does it necessarily mean that their heart changes? No, their heart will change when they put all their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And start listening and obeying the word of God. Eventually all problems are resolved regardless of the method used to address the counselee's concern. However, what biblical therapists endeavor to accomplish is a solution that will meet the Christian counseling objective stated above. It is replacing the lie with the truth. If you still choose to believe the lie, what's going to change? Nux. Nux. Now, 
Remember where the lie originated. And this will give you a very powerful foundational truth on which to assess everything that happens in the future towards your life and your relationship with God. What is it that Satan wanted to accomplish to get man under his power? Yeah, we know the sin was the result. But what is it? Where did it start? Doubt. Doubting God's word. Remember the five D's that lands up in either destruction or deliverance? The very first one is doubt. Now, can you doubt and trust at the same time? No. No. So you've got to learn to put your trust in what God says. And that is the truth. So if you choose to hang on to a couple of little lies, and if you choose to lie, guess what? Very little is going to change. Because it's the lie that holds your belief away from the truth. And that's why we say belief is powerful. It's what you believe. Now you must choose to believe the truth and trust God. Or you must choose to believe the lie and remain in bondage of the lie. Are you making sense of this, guys? By a black, it's so blame that they were. Power scriptures. Romans 10, 10 to 11 says, For with a heart a person believes, in the uh, amplified, adheres to trusts in and relies on Christ. In other words, I stick to, I trust in, and I rely upon Jesus with a heart. And is so justified. Declared righteous, acceptable to God. And with the mouth, he confesses. Remember, we're coming back again to the heart, mind, mouth, action, process. Okay. So with the heart, I believe. With the mouth, I confess. Declares openly and speaks out freely his faith and confirms his salvation. The scripture says, no man who believes in him, who adheres to relies on and trusts in him, will ever be put to shame or disappointed. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of your hope so fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Ne? Joy and peace is the result of believing. Through the experience of your faith. You heard the word of God. You put your trust in the word of God. You confess the Lord Jesus Christ. Your sins are taken away. What happens? You've got peace and you've got joy. That's the result of believing. That by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound and be overflowing with hope. My life is going to get better. It has already changed. I'm no longer depressed and miserable and enraged. I have now got love and joy and peace simply because I made a confession of faith in Jesus Christ. Now, therefore, because this has happened, wow, what isn't there that's waiting for me out there? I'm a baby Christian and I'm going to grow into a full-blown, victorious man of God. That's your hope. The power that changes troubled, empty lives is the power to believe the truth. Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Abiding in means staying in. It's not going in and out of. It is constantly being in. We are now abiding in this room. The moment we go out through that door, we are no longer abiding in this room. So if I abide in Christ, if I stay in Christ, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. 
Sien hoe belangrijk is het? The biblical therapy model in Mark's gospel. Christ vividly illustrated the biblical therapy model in the gospel of St. Mark, chapter 7, verses 14 through to 23, by studying the Greek meaning of the words he chose and the context of his message. We will see why this passage is such an appropriate example of biblical therapy. Let's have a look. The narrative begins with verse 14 and 15. And when he, Jesus, had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken, listen unto me, every one of you, and understand. In other words, put your mind under what I'm telling you. That's to understand. Can you see? Standing under means to understand. I'm putting my mind under the truth that I'm hearing. I'm understanding the truth. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. It's not what you eat and drink, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. Christ had something of extreme importance to teach on this occasion. The Greek word akou is translated hearken in English. The word carries the meaning of one giving an audience to someone or something very important. It possesses a quality of hearing that transcends simple listening. The gravity of his message, the seriousness of his message, is further obvious from the fact that Jesus himself called the meeting. He's called them together to him. It was not another of a long list of popular crowd responses to one of his miracles. This was his meeting with his agenda. In other words, he called the people together to say that something specific to them. He didn't create a miracle and now everybody's flocking there and now he's talking to them. He's calling them to listen. There's a difference. The word understands, sunimi, in the Greek, which conveys the idea of putting something together. It is the process, for example, of gathering data, information, that relates to something that does not make sense. Collating it and processing that information into an explainable, understandable whole. Something was so important that Jesus called a special meeting to clarify a distorted understanding in the minds of the people. He wanted to fix something in their belief system. He wanted them to change their belief concerning a distorted view they had. We can draw three distinct conclusion, conclusions from verses 14 and 15. Jesus called the people together to sufficiently explain the issue until their thinking was straightened out. Because their thinking was distorted. Tradition versus truth. The context of the story that we just referred to. What triggered his sense of urgency. In the verses 1 through 13 we see that the Pharisees and the scribes had objected to Jesus' disciples eating with unwashed hands. Remember he said something about it's not what goes in that defiles a person. It's what comes out. So he wanted to fix something in their thinking. They thought, in order for me to be holy before God, I got to wash my hands, I got to wash between my toes. Have you ever checked the Jews before they go into a feast meal? Hulle was alle spel. Hulle gaan te kere hier ons. They want to make sure that nothing is going to go inside them that's going to defile them. Meantime, they're sitting inside there with adultery and a whole lot of other bad flippant sins running around inside them. They think washing the cup, washing their hands is going to purify them. It's not going to do that. The Arabs are the same. The Muslims, they are not so full of with their halal and all that class of good. They are halal, halal, next they are not. Okay. Why walk not your disciples according to the traditions of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? That's the lie they believed. You follow? Now, he fixes it. Jesus gave him a long explanation in verses 6 through 13. But I call your attention to verses 9 and 13 in particular. In verse 9, Jesus said, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own traditions. You see, it's religion versus what God says. Now, in other words, Jesus was saying to the Pharisees, You do what you do because you believe what you believe. You believe washing the cup, washing your hands, washing this, washing that is going to purify you before God. It's not true. It's going to make no difference. It's your heart where the problem is, pal. Your belief system is warped. 
They believed generational religious lies, traditions. What their forefathers believed. That formed their entire belief system. For generations they had been taught a certain way. And that is why they behaved the way they did. Remember, a lie is as strong as a truth if you believe it. This is biblical therapy's second axiom. Gesegde. People do what they do because they believe what they believe. In verse 13 he continued, Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. A religious lie is one of the worst lies that there is. Because you actually believe this is what God says. And it's not what God says. It's what you interpret. You think God says. And that's very dangerous. Making the word of God or none effect through your tradition, which you have delivered and many such things you do. There's a whole lot of other stuff that relates to this. Now, here we go. Belief. Leads to thought. Leads to feeling. Leads to action. So their wrong beliefs led them to think that if they wash their hands over and over and this and that and the other, that they are going to be made clean. So they go and wash. But does it make them clean? No, because their hearts are still just as defiled as ever. Because their belief system is wrong. You got it? Simple, isn't it? It's not rocket science, but it works. Guard your heart, in other words. You can make a hard kid out there and say, guard it. Okay, belief in the heart. Truth must be received in the human spirit for it to have an effect on the lifestyle. Therefore, truth must be believed in the heart before it can change a person's behavior. Very straightforward statement. The religious crowd of Jesus' day, the scribes and the Pharisees were doing the same thing the masses have been doing for thousands of years. Substituting and accepting lies for the truth. The lies the Pharisees believed were religious and familial. It was from family to family, which made them the most dangerous of all because they are the most believable. Generally speaking, the most trustworthy people are the clergy and our loved ones, or at least they should be. So the lies the Pharisees believed, acted on and taught others were the most insidious of all. No wonder Jesus was so adamant about refuting them. In verses 14 through to 23, Jesus provided us with a solution to exchanging the lies they had been believing for the truth of God. After first explaining that the purpose of his meeting was to correct their distorted thinking, in verse 16, Jesus re-emphasized the value and wisdom of what he was about to say. He said, if any man has an ear, let him hear. He was not talking about surface listening, but a hearing quality that is within the spiritual man's ability to understand. It is more than listening. It is hearing and understanding. Truth must be received in the human spirit for it to have any effect on his lifestyle. Truth must be believed in the heart before it can change a person's behavior. In verse 18, Jesus explained the difference between external and internal man. Just as there is a quality of hearing that makes a difference, there is a quality of internal and external defilement that makes a difference. It is not what goes into a man that defiles him, but that which comes out of a man. The point being that people may be clean on the outside, but filthy on the inside. What is on the inside will eventually surface. That is what defiles the man. The defilement emerges because it was there in the first place. Jesus began in verse 19 to illustrate the quality of the internal man by identifying man's belief system through using the word heart. He said, because it enters not into his heart. He continues in verse 21 with, from within, out of the heart of man, his belief system proceeds. Therefore, the source for man's thoughts, feelings, and action is what he believes. People do what they do because they believe what they believe. Are you able to change your beliefs? Yes. It's a simple decision. Belief produces thought, produces feeling, produces actions. Same little diagram I showed you just now. There we go. That's how it works. Whitewashed, but not washed white. Now, this is by way of illustration. 
There is a rest in peace. There's a whitewashed guy. On the outside, very religious. By his dress, by his behavior, the way he walks, the way he talks. Oh, this oak is so smooth. He is so holy. He is so pious. But what's on the inside? Rotten bones. To the core. Does it? Does it? Does it? Does it? Does it? Does it? Sing along. Moi. Explain. In verse 21, Jesus continued the process, beginning with evil thoughts that produce godless behavior. He then carefully listed some common apparent godless actions of people who are whitewashed, but not washed white. They are adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. And there are their meanings next to them. These are all the things that he lists. They think they're going to get clean. They've just been through a whole purification process. Are they pure? No. They washed on the outside, but not on the inside. Evidence of every value distorted psychological, emotional, moral, spiritual, and behavioral problem is reflected in these actions. They do, however, have a root, as Jesus explained in verse 23. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So the lies we believe produces wrong and problematic thinking, which in turn produces darkened emotions, which cause the wrong actions we call godless behavior. There's godless behavior, lies we believe. Satan is on the inside, you know, like they got intel on the inside here on my PC. That causes problematic thinking. That causes darkened emotions. And that causes finally godless behavior. So where does it all start? With lies. And many of those lies are distorted lies. They sound right. But they ain't right. They are a distorted translation or opinion of what people believe God says. Those are the worst kind. Twelve sayings of biblical therapy. Man was created by God and appointed to manage his life and environment God's way. Genesis 2.15 <laughs> People do what they do because they believe what they believe. Proverbs 23.7 and Mark 7 verses 6 to 23. Jesus established biblical therapy process of replacing the lie with the truth in the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew chapters 5 to 7. He exposed the traditional lies when he said, you have heard it said by them of old times. He's talking about tradition. You agree? This is what the old men have said. Maar die ou mense nooit weet nog die waarheid gepraat. Ah, ah. And then he told them the truth by stating, but I say unto you. Now guys, listen to me. Go and take your Bibles today, sometime or another, and go and read through the Sermon on the Mount. And please do so every couple of months of your life. Because it will always bring you back into perspective of what Jesus teaches us. About the condition of our hearts. Do a heart check. I got to go and see a cardiograph soon. Just to check up on my heart. Because I can't see what's going on in my heart. Nah. But when you get to a certain age, you got to check your heart condition every now and Make sure that all the little veins are still operating and they're open and that this ventricle and that ventricle is doing their job and the rhythms are correct and there's no little failures in this muscle or whatever the case may be. Because I can't see what this dude's doing here on the inside. A lie is as powerful as the truth when you believe it. Children have learned enough lies by the time they are six years old to cause them problems for the rest of their life. People are made free from the bondage when lies are identified and replaced with the truth. John 8 31 to 36. Man is a sinner by nature, by choice and by practice. Did anybody force you to go sin? Huh? Thank you. 
Eve chose to believe Satan's lie over God's truth. Genesis 3, 1 to 13. Go and read it. <coughs> God is always right and man is always wrong if we are not in agreement with one another. <coughs> Yesterday I got a phone call from one of the old students. I'm not going to mention her name. She got married not so very long ago and I didn't pitch up at the wedding. And she's upset with me. But you know what? I didn't agree with that relationship because it started off all wrong. She didn't wait to hear upon the Lord whether or not this is a godly man or not. She didn't follow the normal protocols in building up a relationship, getting to know the guy as a friend before you stop become romantically inclined. Never mind all that. Some shortcut, boom, straight into bed. This will get sick die. So the whole thing is based on a trouble, some emotional response to a guy's bunch of lies. Ooh, I'll do everything for you, chick. Just drop the underwear. And then the result was he was living with her for how long? And what happened? Her insecurity grew and grew and grew and so did her fears. Why? Because a guy is just not putting the ring on her finger. But they claim us what they will hear. He had to get out of his head back. You follow? Now, I cannot condone that kind of behavior. Because it's godless. No, Belt, am I? Oom was weer reg. Hoekom het ek nie maar na oom geluister nie? Ek sê, nie moet nie vir my luister nie. Jy moet luister na wat die woord sê. Die woord sê vir jou. Sex outside of the marriage is sinful. It's trouble. And now you're in trouble. And you got a ring on your finger, but you're married to the wrong O, I'd say. Because this O is not treating you like a godly man at all. Because he's not a godly man. You see? Net omdat ek hom ingeroep het, en ek het hom rechtheid gecounsel, en vir hom gesê, hey pal, hoekom slaap jy met die meisiekin? Jy is die man. Is jy lief vaar? Ja. Nou, hoekom het jy haar nie eers geverloof nie? Hoekom het jy haar nie eers een bykie gekeier nie? Hoekom het jy nie eers laat sy jou leer ken nie? Hoekom slep jy haar somme in die bed in met die klomp vals beloftes? En nou is sy in jou bed en nou trou jy nog steeds jy met haar nie? Jy is een leenaar. Jy lieg. Nou konfronteer ek om daarmee en weet jy wat, as hy daar boe by die hek uit draai, dan sê hy vir haar, hoor jy, daai ou is a wara 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 jy weet, al dan in a bijvoegsels. So now she's in trouble, because she was not prepared to first of all listen to the word of God, before she did anything. Nee, God is always right, man is always wrong when the two of us disagree. So you have a handbook. You've got all these notes. How can you not know? Year after. Hier vandaan af voor en toe. Hoe kan jy nie weet wat die waarheid is as jy handboek het wat net so dik is? Wat jy kan gaan consult nie. You with me guys? Belief in God's word is the most powerful therapy known to man. Jesus said, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. Luke 18 verse 27. There's a bunch of you that took tuk, that took G, that took heroin, that uh, medical people say, your kans om recht te kompel is minder as 1%. Ek sê vir hulle, jylle lieg, want God sê, am al gaan recht kom as hulle in Jesus Christus glo. Do you agree? The battlefield is in the mind of man. Point number eight. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, 2. Very, very, very powerful foundational truth this. Your mind is renewed according to the word of God. Then you know what is right and what is wrong. Because the truth is on the inside. So the moment the lie pops up somewhere, in whatever form the lie comes, guess what? You'll recognize it immediately. Why? Because you've got the truth on the inside. 
And because you've got a truth in the inside, you know what God's will is for you and what is not God's will for you. A proper understanding of the new identity in Christ is a fundamental principle in living a constructive, healthy, and godly lifestyle. Colossians 2, 9-19, and Colossians 3, verses 1-4. to All addiction and destructive compulsive behavior is identified in the Bible as bondage. It's not a disease. It's bondage. It's the bondage of sin. It's the power of sin. It's the power of believing a lie. Now they tune you in AA and NA meetings once an addict. Amen. Alalich. Alalich. Hoe kom die gille? Want hulle weet nie beter nie. Wat weet hulle nie beter nie? Hulle weet nie dat as jy in Christus Jesus is, is jy een nieuwe skepsel. Jy is wedergebore. God verklaar. Jy is vergewe. Jy hele verleer is uitgewas dier die bloed van Jesus Christus. Alles word niet gemaakt. That means everything in your life will be made new. Provided you are allowing your mind to be renewed by the word of God. Because then you'll think differently. And because you think differently and believe differently, what will happen? You'll behave differently. <coughs> Life controlling problems have a spiritual root, regardless of a possible organic disorder. John 9, 1 to 7, you know now what the organic disorder is. It's something that's wrong inside your body itself. Psychiatric and emotional problems are always spiritual problems first. And sometimes they become physical problems. Frequently they are hybrids. They are a mixture of the two. In the presence of cognitive dissonance, that's when the kopje raas, want jy gloe een ding en jy doen een ander ding, a person must perform an emotional bypass procedure and act upon truth. In other words, if my, if my brain's thinking is warped, I'm going to feel warped. And when that situation is consistent in my life. I've got to bypass that. I've got to ignore my emotions. Not allow my emotions to dictate my decisions. And go for the truth. If the truth says something different to what your emotions say, guess what? You're believing a lie. You're stupid to continue along those lines. Change your mind. And start believing the lie. And what will happen to your emotions? What will happen to your emotions? They'll change. Why do I say that? Because emotions are driven by beliefs. Don't forget those little diagrams. That's why I give you those diagrams, man. Who's around me, hele man? Come by. Your belief determines your emotions. If your emotions are freaked out in a situation where you're being counseled, and they are not in agreement with the word of God, guess what? Your emotions are based on a lie. You see how lacquer a person's mind works once it's been rewired. Hmm? And so, when you're feeling something, and the word of God says something else, guess what? There is a cognitive dissonance. The kopieke raas. And on the kopieke raas, is the emotions now? Die mekaar. So what do you do? You change your belief to what the word of God says. Then your emotions will come right. You'll have peace and joy and love and self-control and gentleness and humility constantly. That's the right emotions on the Now that we have determined that it is the belief system that determines the behavior of people, let us have a look at different conditions of the mind when it believes lies in the next chapter.